So, uh, so the theme of this talk is uh, on, uh, I mean, the workshop is on unlabeled videos, but I'm going to cheat a little bit. So the point is not little bit of labeling, weak supervision is more or less what I'm going to try to manage with in this talk. And the theme of this talk is 3D people watching. And I want to start by saying that uh, almost all this work was uh, together with uh, Anju Kanazawa, who used to be a postdoc working with me. Currently, she's visiting at Google. And starting July 1, she's going to be a faculty member at, at Berkeley. So a lot of the credit goes to her and uh, some other students who will be mentioned as we go along. So uh, let me make this a bit better. OK. Uh, so, so the theme which I want, will be running through my talk is perceiving, predicting, and imitating 3D humans from video. So let's start. So there are the, the, what are the set of problems we'll consider? Single view 3D human mesh recovery. Then video based 3D human mesh recovery. Uh, so one is we just solved the problem from a single frame and now we are trying to solve the problem from multiple frames. And uh, Next, we want to predict not just the past, but the future, not just uh, the estimation problem, but prediction. And then we want to go on to uh, how to use this uh, kind of signal for imitation. So this would be for robotics applications. So why does this fit into the unlabeled theme? Because what does classical, uh, what does classical supervised learning require? Classical supervised learning requires paired XI, YI pairs, right? So what we need are pairs of data where you have an image in this sorting, it would be you have the image and then you have a 3D structure or model of the human. And now we would train some neural network to go from the XI's to the YI's. So what, think of what this requires. So look at this video of these uh, people dancing or exercising or whatever they're doing. This requires that we have 3D scans of these people in the moment, right? In order to recover uh, their 3D. Okay, we don't have that, right? We are not, we are not, as these people are dancing, we don't have like a scanner which is immediately capturing the 3D for them. So in general, in this whole space, we have the problem that we don't have paired 2D and 3D data. So, uh, so we are going to have to manage without that. What we will have is decoupled data. So we will have 2D data and we will have 3D data, but the two will not necessarily be paired. And most of what I'm going to talk about in this, uh, in this uh, half hour is essentially how to manage with that theme. So the secret of all the work that we have been doing is to first try to reduce the complexity of the problem of how to characterize the human having a, a morphable model of the human body. So we use this work called Simple Skin Multi-Person Linear Model. This is out of Michael Black's uh, lab. And the basic idea is that uh, we have uh, some parameters which correspond to the shape of the person. So this would capture fat people, thin people, tall people, et cetera, et cetera. So that's this beta. Then there are parameters which correspond to the joint rotations. So in this case, where you can model the joints at the shoulder, elbow, uh, hip, et cetera, et cetera. So that gives us uh, this theta parameters. And then finally, of course, we have the camera. And uh, so given the, the beta and theta parameters, you can uniquely define a mesh. So there's a nice mesh, and then there are coordinates of every vertex on the mesh. And then of course there's a camera and the camera has traditional six degrees of freedom. So the problem of estimating people from the image is going to be converted to the problem of estimating these finitely many parameters. So whatever you've got here, 69, 79 plus six, right? That's the number of degrees of freedom that we have to deal with. Uh, okay, so the, how do we recover these from an image? So that's the problem. And uh, obviously, uh, yeah, so there's no problem there. And we can even cheat a little bit. We could mark key points on those 2D uh, labeled images. Uh, there's 
technology for that. I mean, that falls into the standard paradigm of object recognition where you can put some label, key mark, key, have AMT workers mark key points on, uh, on images. So we can do that. I mean, in later on, I'll try to even get past that key point labeling stage. And then we can do some 3D scans and motion capture. So this, this is tedious. This requires bringing people into the lab. So what the, the secret is going to be, uh, explain the 2D, okay, within the distribution suggested by the 3D. So you can think of this as come, like, you can think GANs, you can think uh, Bayesian, okay, uh, where, where the right side corresponds to the 3D uh, through the, to the prior on shape. So this is the game we are going to play. So, so, so we, I'm going to go through a series of papers and uh, starting with uh, the, what we did for a single image, which we called human mesh recovery. Okay. So, uh, so we uh, start from say an image and then uh, we kind of recover the pose shape camera parameters. And now what we need are some loss functions, right? So you just are going to predict some 3D shapes. So the 3D shape are going to be these parameters of the simple model. And then those have a connection to this mesh. And from that mesh, we can now predict, uh, we can predict various key points, right? So therefore you have a reprojection error. So this is like classic uh, computer vision on the structure from motion era, uh, reprojection error. You try to predict a 3D shape which gives rise to the right 2D key points, right? That's what, uh, or 2D, uh, in that case, it might have been uh, SIFT, uh, SIFT feature locations. So that's what we do. We have a guest shape. Uh, the guest shape is a mesh uh, determined by these 85 parameters. Therefore, we know there is a certain vertex, let's say vertex 276, and that corresponds to the left elbow. So we can now determine what the projection of that is, and we can compare that with what we see in the image. So it can be trained with 2D reprojection loss. So that's fairly straightforward. You need some architectures for the network, but these are details you can look up. And we did this, and this is the kind of stuff we got. Okay, it's horrible stuff, right? You look at these, uh, so these reconstructions, if you look at them, by the way, they are consistent in terms of key point locations. Okay, so look carefully at the left knee, the right knee, the left hip, the right hip, etc., And those are in the right places, okay? But the person looks horrible. And this is where the fact that you do not have direct 2D to 3D supervision is coming in and it's, uh, it, it, it's killing us. So uh, more examples of these monsters. So this, this is a real phenomenon, not just an imagined phenomenon. Okay, so, okay, I think by now you're probably sick of seeing these monsters. Okay, so what do we do? So the secret is we want these reconstructions, but in the right space. So in the space of humans, not monsters. So therefore what you need is to train a discriminator and the discriminator is going to distinguish humans from non-humans, these weird monsters. So that's this discriminator and that's going to say yes or no. So that becomes another loss. And the cool part is that we can just train the discriminator with, with, uh, with just separate 3D data, which is not coupled to the 2D data. So, so the, the 2D, the key point annotations we can get from any standard 2D data set. So like MS Coco, I mean, which is in the wild, it shows the variety of human poses and uh, behavior. It's not 3D. Human 3.6M is in the uh, is not in the wild, but it is genuinely 3D, and they can give rise to 2D projections. So that's the, the spirit. So, so the benefits of recovering. Uh, 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 so once you have got, I mean, so now uh, uh, so this basic machinery works, and here are some of the reconstructions and. What we're trying to show off is that these reconstructions are, are good. So we can look at people from different viewpoints and it works correctly because the standard rule of checking out at any 3D recovery system is that it should work from novel viewpoints, not, not just from the standard viewpoint. 
and uh, uh, you get completion because you are you uh, so these are always the values of bringing in a 3d model so once you have a 3d model you can get the parts which you can't see right because you you plugged in a 3d model into the space and so now uh, you 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 can look at it from different viewpoints occlusion is not a problem etc cetera, etc cetera. and here are some of the kinds of reconstructions that we got and uh, yeah and and of course if you just recall that we have this mesh so we can label uh, the vertices of the mesh that these vertices of the mesh correspond to the head of the person these vertices correspond to the to the arm and this to the leg etc so you can get the part segmentation for free and predictions of occluded parts etc etc and here is a reconstruction where this technique has been applied at a single frame level so this paper was from eccb 2018 so this is two years ago and since then there have been uh, further developments and this technology is getting better and better i should say where it fails it fails uh, where where people are very occluded so I think there is still work to be done for very, very occluded people. But uh, when you have reasonably large, reasonably unoccluded people, this technology is, is really good and can be used uh, for other stuff. But obviously, one thing which you can see right here is that we are, we are doing this kind of prediction or estimation at a single frame level. Okay, so this is not satisfying, right? You want to make use of the sm temporal smoothness. So, uh, okay, how are we going to do that? So, we can time honored tradition in computer vision is you just throw in a smoothness term, but we should be able to do better than that because the kind of smoothness that you want would vary with the activity, right? So suppose somebody is running in a hurdles race and they are you know, running and jumping over hurdles, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, as opposed to somebody just uh, sitting or walking, the, the, the smoothness term should somehow be different in the two settings, right? So it should not be some generic lambda time, some uh, loss on, uh, on change, but it should be learned. It should be based on the data. It should correspond to to, to uh, the particular activity that the human is doing. So, uh, okay, so this is just advertisement that uh, in the neural ne network revolution, we don't need to do uh, lots of iterative optimization. Okay, so now let me get to how do we, uh, what's the appropriate way to treat video clips? So we call this HMMR, so it's a mesh and motion recovery. So each, uh, so we can imagine this function f, which spit gives given a single frame spits out the three D model, and pose and, and camera, of course. So I'll uh, tell you about our work on three D human dynamics. So this was at last CBPR. So uh, first of all, the proof of the pudding does it work? And uh, so these are uh, this is the difference between on the left is a single frame algorithm, the right is the the algorithm which makes use of temporal context and it's much smoother and it also looks better when you see it from a different viewpoint. Okay, so how are we going to do it? So we basically have to convert the problem from a spatial problem to a spatial temporal problem. So, so you have the image, so you have some architecture which is spitting out these phi sub t's. So think of these as essentially embeddings, right? So embeddings which you obtain at a single frame level. Okay, what we are going to do is, we are going to try to arrive at a spatio-temporal representation. So this is what we are calling this F, uh, this movie. This function F movie is going to produce this uppercase phi. So this uppercase phi is a representation which has been built up from the representations of single frames, okay? So, and now what we are going to do is, okay, how do we make this representation be good? So this is now a spatial temporal representation. It's like an intermediate representation. And what we are going to do is we are going to impose some reconstruction losses on that. 
So if we, uh, so from this, we can do a readout function, which can read out the 3D at uh, any moment in time. So we can read out the 3D at a moment in the past or a moment, the moment now or a moment in the future. And this is where there will be losses imposed. So we try to make sure that this, this representation, the uppercase phi sub t, is a good one because it predicts the right 3D shape at different frames. So you have a loss on 3D, loss on 2D. This would be key point projection. And then there is, of course, that adversarial prior that we mentioned already. OK, back to the cha usual challenge of uh, what's the size of data sets that we have. We always have in the in video, the our grand challenge is always that we have tons and tons, infinite amounts of data, which is unlabeled, uh, but labeled data is scarce to combine. For in particular, 3D data is going to be very difficult to come by. So this is the size of H 3.6M. There is a pen action. Label data is limited, but plenty of unlabeled videos. I mean, you know, uh, YouTube is collecting data at some huge rate, which uh, there'll be other people who can point the numbers out. So in fact, we decided to try this trick, which is, is the 2D technology now good enough that we could use this as pseudo ground truth? So we had some genuine 2D uh, uh, key point labels, which humans had marked. And then we said, okay, the state of the art of 2D joint detection is good enough that we can use that as pseudo ground truth. And in fact, we tried to do that and it helped. I mean, it's remarkable, but it works. So this is the data set collected from Instagram. It's called Insta Variety. And uh, if you see, there is tons and tons of variety here. I mean, these are good, nice uh, data because uh, figures are reasonably uh, lots of pixels, uh, not that much occlusion, but lots of interesting action. The 2D key point detectors that we have do a pretty good job. Okay, so that's what you're seeing here. Okay, so uh, there's another data set called Vlog and this Insta variety. So this is pseudo ground truth, okay? And, uh, and, and this works. And uh, so this is uh, label, uh, uh, so look at the error. So the error has come down by using pseudo labels. So it was 126.7 and now it's come down to 116.5. So, and, it's not, uh, so we were, we, we were trying this, hoping that this would work, but it actually did work. And uh, it's not that surprising in hindsight, similar ideas have been done in language and they do like something called back translation and it works. And so uh, another picture. So these are some of the results that we get. And, uh, and always for 3D reconstruction, you try to show what this looks like from a different viewpoint to convince people. Okay, so now, uh, now what we wanted to do was to, to go from perceiving to understanding. So can we do uh, imitation learning? So, uh, so first we wanted to play this game. Can we predict 3D motion from a single image? So, so if you think of this, uh, this, uh, this video clip, so there's a video clip, but if I saw even a single frame, I can sort of imagine the video clip, right? So how do we do that? So suppose I have a single frame. So what do we do here was we, 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 we did the following. We imagine we created a hallucinator function. So this hallucinator function H, uh, so imagine that you have a video clip. So you have at training time, you do have this video clip. And now what you do is you form a single frame, which is which shows a person in a typical action pose. You have this hallucinator function. And this hallucinator function is trying to reconstruct that movie strip. The same, the movie strip for which you now have ground rate data because we trained it from the full video data. And then you can put a, a sort of a loss between these two. So basically now from single images, you can do a reconstruction of this imagined video, uh, video clip. And, uh, and uh, yeah, 
So here is this image. So you, here you see this person. Now you, you can guess what this person is doing, right? You can imagine this stroke, you imagine that there'll be the follow through, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we are imagining because we have previously seen this kind of a photograph in the context of a video clip. So we can directly estimate the 3D, but we can also guess what the 3D was in the past and what the 3D will be in the future. So if you have, and all this requires is uh, unlabeled video. So we can now, with this unlabeled video, we can train the models which given single photographs can predict uh, the, the, the past and the future in some form. And you can compare with the actual past. So these are some examples of those. And particularly with action shots, a good action shot is one where from a single photograph, you can imagine what will be happening in a video clip. I mean, uh, if you, you think back to the, say 50 years ago, I mean, there were magazines like Life magazines, which were, whose circulation was that they had very good photographs and TV was not widely available in everybody's home. So they, people perceived the movement and all the excitement of a, a sports event from just single photographs. Okay, so next question is, can we do this long range? And uh, if you want to do long range prediction, then you want to make the setup to be auto regressive. So this is a, a paper we published last year at ICCV. So predicting 3D human dynamics from video. So what's the setup? So the setup is there's some input video. And then uh, we, we, can, we, we can do the, we can, we can stop this video at some point and try to predict the, the rest of the video. Okay, so let me go back here. So this is the input videos. Okay, what we're gonna do is block it at some point, right? And now say, okay, the computer has to produce the rest. And this is the actual truth. So what actually happened? And we want to predict the future. Now the, the prediction of the future here is going to be done uh, not as pixels, I mean, uh, as you will see in other talks, I mean, uh, prediction can be approached in various stages. You can approach it at pixel level. You can approach it at as the uh, as the output of a continent layer at a fairly high stage. In our case, our uh, we have the representation we are going to use is three D, so three D models and simple models, and. Uh, uh, of course, once you have the 3D model, you can predict it from a different viewpoint. So, so now the setup has to be causal. You can only make use of information from the past. But this is a relatively minor tweak of the model we had pu published previously, which made use of bidirectional information. I mean, this stuff should be very reminiscent of what's happening in the language space, right? So in language, uh, we, we build a model from the past. Uh, we, I mean, we build models at training time, we can use bi-directional information, but, uh, but uh, at test time, we are going to have information from the past. So that F movie here, the difference between this, this, this function and the one I'd shown you earlier was that this is causal. So it only makes use of frames from the past and it produces a movie strip representation. And from that movie strip, we can, uh, we can uh, decode it down to, to the 3D, uh, 3D models. And uh, uh, so, and then we can put a loss on all of this, a, lo a 3D loss, 2D loss, adversarial prior. And uh, uh, now how we're going to proceed is that we are going to try to pre predict the movie strips as we go along. So, so we have, uh, so, so we, we have this prediction. Okay, uh, this is uppercase phi sub zero tilde. Okay, now once you have predicted it, now you can add that to the sequence. So think of the analogy with language. You have a sequence of words. You have a system which can predict, uh, you are now going to try to predict many words into the future. You predict it one word at a time. So you predict this new word, you act as if it's now ground truth, and then you continue. Except that what we are doing is, we are doing this, this extension, this uh, auto regression, in this intermediate representation of the movie strip. 
and now uh, and and so you just keep on doing this so the intermediate representation is being extended over time and that's a predicted future sequence the movie strip is being predicted over time and from this you can you can decode it to get the 3d okay and then uh, of course there will be various losses and so forth so results uh, uh, so some uh, uh, prediction and then different viewpoint etc cetera, etc cetera. so this is uh, anyway i i find this quite fun because i think uh, there's been lots and lots of work in this area in the context of language but uh, this shows that these ideas apply in the context of uh, video and specifically our uh, focus was on 3d re recovery okay uh, imitation so this is like a cute video which shows that uh, this kid was learning from observing what was on TV. And uh, so, so what we want to do is, a, is not just observe the world, but act in it. So we want to figure out not just the position of the, the arm and the hand, but to have this notion of what are the associated actions, right? So, so this kid is trying to learn from his dad. Okay, so uh, imitation learning, learning from demonstrations. I mean, this is an area which has been much studied. And there's been a fair amount of work on starting from mocap. And uh, 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 this is work from uh, actually people at Berkeley, uh, Peng et al. with uh, Sergey Levin and Peter Abir, and but with mocap data. Mocap data is difficult to come by, right? Okay, so so this is the uh, is uh, trying to do this with just video. So the idea is you have these YouTube video clips, and you can see people doing cartwheels and various other uh, gymnastic activities. Can we observe this? That's it. That's all we have. These video clips. Can we from those uh, teach a humanoid to perform the same kinds of actions? So this is the video, okay. And now, you know, we have our technology, right? So HMR, HMMR, and with that, we can recover the mesh and it's temporarily smooth. And uh, now uh, we want to use that to train a policy in a physical simulator. So note, we are not just, uh, we, we need this to be a humanoid robot in a physical simulator where there is physics. The, the, the training will provide examples where what in the training you try to do is you try to have the, uh, so the, the, the robot has to figure out what actions to apply at every joint, right? So that's what it has to do. So we don't know that. We don't have that information. The actions at every joint, we don't know. What we know is if these actions were being, if the right, Torques were being applied at every joint, the resulting position of the body, I mean, this has been run through the physical simulator, should be something like that of the guy on the left. So, so we, we now have a reward signal, which is the imitation of the human, but it is a non-trivial problem because you have to figure, you have to solve the inverse problem. You have to figure out what should be applied at every joint, right? So that's a, a, a policy. But it's an easier problem than the classical, uh, classical RL setting. Because in a classical RL setting, suppose you want to teach the system to walk, teach the robot to walk. Well, the loss comes from whenever the robot falls down, right? And so it basically has to keep tr trying zillions of trials until it can walk without falling. Here, the reward becomes dense because at every frame, you have something to aspire to. You're trying to match. The, the output uh, shape, the, what you can observe, the observables of the human in the video. And once you have this policy, then you have a policy. And that policy can be applied in settings where the morphology is different. So this Atlas robot now has a backpack. But uh, so the direct imitation is not correct there, right? But you have a policy, so that can be carried over. 
and you can retarget to different environments because you have this physical simulator underneath and uh, and uh, policy and uh, okay the usual canonical torture of robots demo except that this is in, in simulation so uh, some more examples so <coughs> so to me this is a very promising area now uh, let me uh, list the limitations of this work the limitations of the work, this work is that we are dealing with whole body movement uh, the body is fairly cleanly visible not that much occlusion lots of pixels uh, we would be interested in doing this for for manipulation actions right so i'm assembling some ikea furniture etc cetera, etc cetera. so there there is a, a a greater challenge because there's more occlusion the objects are half hidden uh, uh, the body human body is half hidden the, the more subtle movements of uh, the hand may be required, et cetera, et cetera. But in principle, uh, uh, this, this is, I think, a very, uh, it should be a central area of interest for us. It very nicely connects robotics and vision because uh, we can literally teach them what to do. Okay, so I think these are just more examples. Uh, Gangnam style didn't work. Uh, but tons and tons of examples. So application is physics-based motion cap completion, reference video. So these are all possible things we might be able to do in the future. So, uh, I, uh, so I'll uh, conclude here so that we have time for plenty of time for questions. So, uh, so the summary here is uh, we showed how we can recover 3D humans from video, single frames how we can do this over uh, time uh, where just to improve the quality of the estimation and then genuinely do prediction in autoregressive way plus from a single frame and then this technology also gives us uh, an ability to learn to act by if we have example videos available thank you very much and um, i've ended early so that we have time for questions Okay, thank you very, 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 very much, Chandra. That was fantastic. Um, so if there's, um, we were a few questions in the chat, and I'll ask, ask them. But um, if anyone thinks of any any others, please um, just post them in the chat. Um, so first question is from Victor, who says, as Dima Daman said, we are seeing so much progress in humans, um, partly due to to simple. Do we need more parametric models of the world? If so, which entities are next, and which not? Okay, so so uh, so there is first uh, the gradient descent step from simple, which is like simple X and so forth, which is to have models of faces and models of hands, which are incorporated. So those uh, those need to be there. Okay, next uh, I think then let's talk about other. And obviously, you can imagine the same ideas applying to animals, right? And uh, so this I expect will happen. This is just the natural course of things. So what's interesting is other objects, right? So other objects, then what we would like are 3D models or other objects, right? And that's the, the, the game that people are playing today with, uh, you know, 3D reconstruction of object shape from a single image. The challenge there is data. So the, what the a lot of the research in that area is based on shape net. And uh, so what are shape net models? Shape net models are people have gone and uh, scraped the web for freely available CAD models. Do they actually correspond to the objects in front of us and the image? Not necessarily, right? There have been some attempts which say, okay, in this picture, I can see IKEA furniture and let me go into the IKEA catalog and see if I can find the, the model for that. So. These are, these are good efforts. I mean, this is what we can do. I mean, but this is, this, is, this is a long way off, right? Because I want 3D models corresponding to my the specific chair, which is in front of me. I want, uh, you know, all the objects in my kitchen, I mean, et cetera, et cetera. So my, uh, my thinking about this is that the central issue here is that we want to be able to 3 d not just people, but also objects. And uh, this has always been a debate in computer vision. Should we do 3D or 2D? 
And my general conjecture is that physics, uh, I mean, Euclidean physics, uh, sorry, Newtonian physics operates in the 3D world. So, so that setting will be very natural. And if you see this example of this, this robot, which has learned to imitate the action, this is in the context of a physics simulator, which is going to operate in 3D, right? So I believe that if we could 3Dify objects, and, and we, we, we can 3Dify people already, then consider the conjunction in the context of some f valid physical models. I think that that will give us uh, some extra juice. Uh, but this is a conjecture, it needs to be shown. Right. Um, next question is from uh, Rahul. Um, how do you compare OpenAI's Rubik's Cubes manipulation ro robotic arm work with these 3D models? How are, how are they? How are the uh, how are, I guess how are the ones today related and, and different? Uh, what is your opinion of of their work? Yeah, so uh, so the OpenAI Rubik's Cube that approach is uh, so that's a different approach. So that approach relies on doing tons and tons of work in simulation, right? So it's a multi-fingered hand. It it's trained completely in simulation, and then the final product. I mean, it's like I I don't remember the numbers, but it's some huge number of simulation. And then when you you do it in the real world, you get something which works half the time, or I don't know what that percentage is. It's it's a low percentage. You couldn't use it for anything practical. Now in their worldview, it makes sense because there is this worldview which is that. Uh, what we could do for uh, Go, we can do for anything, which is that in simulation, we have infinite amounts of data. So you're relying on the simulator to produce, to have infinite amounts of labeled data. Now, what happens is that there is a gap and, and the gap is that, I mean, Go or chess, the rules are exact and with a simulator will work perfectly. When we talk about a real world movements, not so much. Now, my experience in robotics has been is that simulations work really well for navigation kinds of tasks, but they don't work well for manipulation tasks. Mm -hmm. And uh, the difference is because of the physics of contact. So when objects are moving around, so imagine you have a wheeled robot. So wheeled robots has to move around and it's trying not to be in contact. It's trying to avoid obstacles. So it's movement in free space. And here, I, I mean, uh, we, are, we have found and many people have found that you can train robots in simulator, put them on a real robot, it just works. Now, when you come to manipulation of objects by the hand, then we have to deal with the physics of contact. Now, in principle, that physics is also known, but there are lots of parameters we don't know. We don't know the friction coefficients. We don't have exact models of what will happen at every joint in terms of the motors and, and so on and so forth. The object itself may be deformable. So the, the simulator is, the gap is much greater. And then you have to go through lots of techniques like domain randomization, et cetera, et cetera. And then after that, you transfer to the real robot and still you need to have lots of training. So I feel that, uh, I feel that that's the space in which, in which uh, this kind of imitation learning will, will have a very, very important role to play. And if you think about humans, right, human society, we are not like our hunter-gatherer forefathers 100,000 years ago, right? Where maybe even 100,000 years ago, I could imagine one caveman learned some trick of how to chisel a particular stone and shows it to his friends, right? Even then, there would probably have been some amount of learning from teaching or demonstration. But today we have culture. We learn from our parents, we learn in school, et cetera, et cetera. So why should we throw it all away and discover it ab initio by vanilla reinforcement learning? So I think almost all things in, uh, in, uh, in robotics should be subject to imitation learning. So I'm sorry, I'm giving a long-winded answer, but philosophically to me, this is very important. You need some capability, which is, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is tuning in the real world, which should be very small, but the rest uh, imitation learning can go a long way. So I'll give you another example, uh, playing tennis, right? 
uh, imagine trying to do it with a vanilla RL system. It'll take you millions of trials just to get the racket to be near a ball. Whereas humans can start playing tennis in like one trial, right? Because you know about the properties of rackets and balls and so on. And then after that, you refine over years of practice and I'll never be as good as Nadal. But, uh, but, uh, but you get a big leg up from the imitation learning part, the models of uh, common sense physics, et cetera, et cetera. Great. Um, okay, next question is from Aditya. Um, most of the results are on single humans. Are these approaches scalable to multiple humans and what are the challenges? I think the, uh, the, uh, that's a perfectly valid point. I think we need to show that these approaches work for multiple humans. And uh, so I think of it as uh, human movement. We can characterize that in sort of three meta categories. One meta category is just a human by himself or herself. And then it's really all pose changes. So the example that you see here, this guy cartwheeling is that and the people on the left are dancing. So this is what we can do now well. Okay. Second category is human object interactions. And the third category is human human interaction. Okay. So these are three meta categories of which I think one of them we have nailed quite well. And the other two are, are, are still work to be done. Human human I think should be doable, but I think right now there, uh, I mean, it's, it's a bit tricky because there are because there's entanglement of the different parts of the body and so on, people hugging, et cetera, et cetera. But I feel that I I think I think that in the next couple of years we'll see that being done. I think objects are to me human object interaction may turn out to be harder because you lose much more of the signal. Hmm. And I think the distinction there between the personal view and the first person view and the third person view may be significant. Right. So because in the first person view of an action, you also have access to touch signals and so on and so forth. So so that complicates things. Right. So there is some signal which you cannot transfer from another person. So the third person view, which is what we are using here, third person view does not have access to the touch signal. Right. Third person view is good for person person and person post change. Okay, um, I think maybe last question. Um, so until the, is this from, from uh, Bjorn Omer? Um, until the 80s models, until the 80s, model-based vision was our only way to deal with the complexity of the world. Thereafter, appearance-based approaches avoided er early commitment to a parametric simplification of the world. To what extent do you consider the new, the new need for parametric models a step back, back or forward? I, I think, uh... Okay, so, so first of all, in, in my view, we always want the 3D because this is part of our perception of the world. So there is a question of this is an important output we want. Get an image. I'm not interested in the image for its own sake. I am interested in the image for what it tells me about the world. Okay, so I think that's the reason. Now what, uh, so we want 3D output. That's to me just axiomatic. We want that as an end in itself, not just as an accompaniment to other things. Uh, I think what we had earlier, the reason, the difference between what we were doing in the 80s with versus now is that then the 3D was kind of a, a crutch. We didn't know how to exploit the pixels well. We couldn't squeeze out the information in the pixel. So we tried and we did, couldn't deal with too much data. So we wanted to get rid of the pixel as quickly as possible. So we take the pixels, detect edges or corners, and then throw away the pixels as rapidly as you could. Now, in that process, enough had been lost. So now the only way to regularize the problem was by the invocation of 3D models. And we had decided that dealing with the pose change was the most important problem. And dealing with the variability in appearance was something we were going to punt on in the computer vision community. In the pattern recognition community, it was the other way around. So they focused on problems like recognizing digits, where there was no 3D variation to be considered. It's all a 2D problem. But they were very genuinely concerned about the variation in appearance. So 
circa 1990, I mean, these two communities were both justified in their perspective, I would say. They are just abstracted away. There are two essential parts of the problem. There's variability in up here, uh, and, and then there is 3D. And one had thrown away 3D and the other had thrown away variability. Today, what we are trying to do is to uh, genuinely deal with both of them. And that's clearly the way to go. So. Okay, uh, fantastic, Chandra. Thanks so much.